Kanne Hedegård, um, Norway as a battery, what do you think? I agree with uh, much of what the minister said in, in the end about this. Europe must focus much more on a Europeanized energy policy. Luckily, it was also the conclusions from the heads of states two weeks ago when they were having a di thematic discussion on energy policies. So we must get the interconnectors right, we must get the infrastructure right, we must invest much more, both in efficiency, renewables, the whole variety. And they also said um, that there should be a stronger focus on the infrastructure across borders. There it is uh, not working well enough. And by the way, they also said liberalized gas markets uh, is also a key to bringing down the cost of energy in Europe. So there is a whole range of things we have to do, but we must do it with cross-border thinking, Europeanized energy thinking, instead of every thinking stopping at the national border. Is Norway already part of the solution? I think Norway is very much part of the solution. Now, I come from uh, Denmark, and we have this uh, Nordic way of doing things, as was also mentioned, but we also saw from uh, the professor's sort of... Uh, uh, what, the, the interconnectors to Britain, and that we are starting to build this up, but I think that there is still a lot of investments that need to be done on this. Maybe I could take the chance just to sort of disagree with one thing, or rather correct one thing that m the minister said, because the minister said uh, that we must keep our eyes on a few facts, but then you said that emissions in Europe were increasing. This is simply not true. Germany and Great Britain. As long as, uh, as late as today, it has been confirmed that the emissions of Europe fell 1.9% last year. We are on a tra trajectory where emissions steadily are decreasing, and that also goes for the countries that can be fluctuations, but Europe is decreasing emissions year after year. I think that's just very important that we do not say, oh, now they are uh, reducing in the United States. Uh, final thing, what we should also bear in mind is that in the United States, the average emission per capita is more than 17 tons. The average in Europe is 7.8 tons, so we must be doing something right. This could be very interesting, of the two politicians, and then we can have the, the, the academic as in referee. So, politician, please. <laughs> no, no, I, I wasn't saying... Do you agree? That. Just for the facts. For the facts, okay, <laughs> yeah. I said that the emissions in Germany and the United Kingdom uh, are rising. This is uh, big economies uh, in uh, Europe, and especially when it comes to Germany, it's a huge paradox because they have invested so heavily in renewables. But you now see a renaissance for coal for the reasons that I just mentioned, and uh, that means that the emissions are going up, as are the energy prices, and the competitive competitiveness of the German economy is going down. And this is the combination of cheap coal and heavily subsidizing their own uh, energy markets. Then I think that, of course, emissions in Europe are going uh, down, but at the same time, uh, Europe is, uh, many European countries are in a recession. Uh, and uh, the reason for uh, lower uh, emissions are lack of economic uh, activities. So it's important to remember that uh, we need growth, we need uh, sustainable growth, uh, and uh, recession is not a, part of, uh, it's not a part of the solution for the climate crisis. Yes? So I think the professor, you, please. Thank you. I think if you look at the short run, of course, you, you see um, a consequence of, of the U.S. shale gas that U.S. coal prices go down and, and coal comes into the, into the market and, and becomes more competitive also in the short run in, in, in Europe. And that's, of course, worrying both from a climate perspective and, and from a perspective of selling Norwegian gas, which is, is clear. But, uh, but I think it's more important what happens in the long run. If the long run EU policy will promote uh, an integrated market where the risk is reduced for the companies and the countries that are going to invest in the capacity to produce clean energy, and in the grid to transport uh, clean energy. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, Connie had to go the long run. You have expressed uh, your concern against nuclear power. What's, what's your take on the long run? How will it look? I think that that is why we need to sort of put up the targets for the longer time. It's clear that we could do a lot of things right now. Say, for instance, shale gas. And that could be maybe fine. Now, I saw a new report yesterday that most of the big investors have sort of dropped Poland as a market to invest in this because 
the efficiency of the storage, uh, the, the, the capacities there on shale gas is not what people thought only 12 months back. So we must have some realistic uh, assessments there, but what we must understand is that when we are talking about energy policies and you make an investment today, it stands there for the next 40, 50 years. So if we are moving towards a low carbon society by the middle of this century, it is imperative that already now we take care to get the right mix of tools. And that can be bridging to fossil fuels, like uh, gas, of course, but according to the International Energy Agency, what pays most off for Europe to do, that is to focus on efficiency and renewables. That is the highest expertise on these issues in the world, and that is a very, very firm recommendation to Europe. We must also uh, do energy efficiency savings and renewables. That pays mm. off in the longer term for Europe. So a mix of eff a efficiency mix. and renewables. Ola uh, I, I think that um, the debate that uh, the Commission has uh, invited Europe to start upon uh, uh, now, what are going to be the mechanisms and the targets uh, and the means and ways after 2020 going forward is uh, extremely important. And probably one of the most important uh, debates that uh, European countries and governments uh, needs to embark upon over the coming years. Uh, we have all set our targets uh, up to 2020. Now it's uh, what's, going, uh, what's going to happen afterwards. And I think that uh, the key message, um, the number one issue needs, uh, in my, at least in my opinion, in my head, needs to be how we can reduce uh, emissions and increase efficiency as cost-effective as possible. Thereby uh, making sure that we uh, are able to Get, a, get sustainable uh, growth. Um, I'm not uh, sure that all the things that we have been doing right now uh, are working the way it should be. Uh, taking the German example, uh, with very expensive subsidies for solar, uh, which is not extremely effective, and uh, increased emissions uh, because of cheap US coal. What I do believe in, and uh, where I hope that uh, the Commissioner agrees is that Europe, together with Norway and the Nordic countries, needs to unlock the potential that lies in a better functioning European energy market. It could look the way uh, that uh, the Professor uh, told us and showed us uh, just a few minutes ago, but today we see 27 or 28 different support schemes for renewables. We see a lack of investments in infrastructure. Uh, we see different uh, means and ways when it comes to production of uh, nuclear and coal and gas, and there's different strategies all over. And from my point of view, it seems like Europe is using the climate issue to renationalize parts of the uh, economy and uh, politics that has been a part of the common European market for, uh, for 50 years. Mm. And if that development continues, I'm sure that uh, the costs are going to be extremely high and the results are going to be bad and we are not able to unlock the resources like and the potential in I would like to hear the most reaction to that. But before that, I'd like to ask you, Dr. Thomas Gord, uh, efficiency has been talked about for ages. I mean, all the years I've been a reporter, I heard mm. politicians talk about how you could efficient, make more efficient the energy sector. Is there more to, 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 to take on this? Well, it depends uh, what kind of efficiency you would like to have. I mean, when you discuss efficiency in the, in the climate measures, an economist would normally answer you should have a carbon price and a global carbon price, and that would be the most efficient. On the other hand, if you look at European climate policy in the 2020 scenarios, they, of course, have other objectives than climate as well. Uh, they have the security of supply, they have economic growth, uh, and they have also building competence on, on renewable energy. As so targets. it's more so, to achieve. So I, I, I can fully understand the diversified strategy they have chosen. And, and when it's criticized for not being efficient, uh, well, you first need to define deficient towards which objective. Mm -hmm. the, the energy markets to, to re-nationalize? No, I think that it was a very positive sign that the heads of your states in Europe two weeks ago sort of said, okay, we know, we have to make more open energy markets. And it's not enough just to put it into a declaration and decide that we want to do that. Now we actually need to implement it. And I think that the whole European budget 
is sort of proof of how there would be more money going this way, so that people in, out in the regions, for instance, they will only get part of the money if they are actually now starting to, to get it right on the energy infrastructure. So there are many things we can do also from the overall European level. Could I say just one thing about energy efficiency? We can say, yes, we have heard about that for a long time in Norway, in Denmark, in many places. But I think even in our countries, we would agree that there is still a huge potential, cost-efficient potential. But then go to, to, uh, to uh, Poland, or go to our Baltic friends, or go, as I did last week, to Bulgaria. I mean, there is a huge potential still in Europe. We are wasting loads <coughs> of energy, and we are, instead of being more efficient ourselves, we are sending the checks to Putin's Russia and to the Middle East. And I think if you ask the citizens what makes sense to address climate change, this is one of the areas where actually we can also manage to, uh, to create the jobs. Mm -hmm. Could I say something on the feed-in tariffs for, uh, and subsidies for renewables? Because I agree that there we have a problem, we have a challenge. If you want a Europeanized energy system, then it cannot be that, say, a farmer in the southern part of Denmark will drive his biogas to the northern part of, of Germany, just on the other side of the border, because there the feed-in tariff for biogas will be three times what it is in Denmark. We cannot compete on whose purse is the biggest. Mm. And that is, of course, why uh, in the European Commission, why we are now preparing this 2030 package of targets. Mm. In parallel with that, we are overviewing and analyzing our subsidies for energy, state aid for energy and environment, in order to say, after 2020, when we have a more Europeanized system, then, of course, we must also have a more Europeanized approach to subsidize renewables and also a more dynamic approach so that if you have mature renewable technologies, they should, of course, not be subsidized forever after. Mm -hmm. Then you must have a flexible, dynamic system where mature technologies are not getting subsidized anymore, but then be a bit faster subsidizing the immature new technologies coming up. Do you agree, Ola Um a little bit. A little bit, yes. <laughs> because I think that um, uh, what uh, the Commissioner just said is uh, the reason uh, we should uh, end subsidies on the renewable uh, energy production in 2020. It's, uh, it's the best argument for not continuing to heavily subsidize renewable energies all over Europe because it uh, disrupts the markets. It uh, is impossible to unlock the dynamics and the possibilities that lies in the market and the number one huge um, question I think we should ask ourselves because now we use all this money, all these resources that we of course could have used otherwise to subsidize renewable energy and we put it into the market and as a consequence of that the carbon prices are low making it possible for the Bulgarians to keep on uh, spending resources in a way that we don't want. To so, keep the windows open and the heater on? Of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, uh, the best signal, the best way of, make, um, of increasing efficiency in society and the economy is through pricing. And of course, if we want to reduce uh, the CO2 emissions in Europe, we should make sure that we have a higher price on carbon. But now we are spending huge amounts of public money in all European countries to subsidize renewables. And you should stop it. Um, can I just add one, uh, just one thing that is important? Because I think that in, in essence we agree I, we just come from a joint meeting where I've heard about how you're subsidizing a lot of energy efficiency uh, pr uh, productions in Norway and also renewables. So it's not that we are not I, I know that we are seeing subsidizing how we should Norway, subsidize yeah. things. But just be aware, every time the world is spending $1 subsidizing renewables, we are spending $7 subsidizing fossil fuels. So uh, I agree that in the perfect world, where we had all the disadvantages uh, incalculated in the price, for instance, also on fossil fuels, uh, then we could have that discussion. But I think for a foreseeable future, some kind of support for new technologies will be needed. But that is why it's important to ensure that it's a level playing field. Now we need a comment from the scientific world. So, so what I hope is that uh, in, in 2030, all of the technologies will compete at a level playing field, uh, really, and that, that the subsidies have been used for immature technologies to drive them forward. And what we see today is that renewables have been preferred, for example, as compared to CCS uh, in this situation. And, 
And, and one of the things that worry me as a researcher is that I see if you want to reach these uh, ambitious uh, targets, both in the 2020 and the 450 scenario, CCS is part of the solution uh, uh, around 2030, 2040 coming in full scale. And at the moment, uh, all the subsidies goes to renewable energy and very little to demonstrate this technology that seems to be necessary to have 20 years from now. So, so I'm worried about you, this So step. you agree with Borten Moore? I, I think, uh, for fairness, you need subsidies to get from an immature technology to a mature technology, but you shouldn't subsidize a mature technology. Okay, uh, more brief comment. Uh, no, it's very true, because uh, it's fair to use subsidies to get new technologies in, and to develop new technologies for uh, research, for uh, introduction into the markets. But if you look at uh, the way we use subsidies to today, we are subsidizing windmills. It's, it's not a new technology. You have been building windmills in Denmark for generations, in Holland for hundreds of years. You know it works. We are building hydropower plants with the subsidies. We have been building them for, for hundreds of years in, in Norway. It's, it's not to introduce new technologies. It's just to subsidize new production. Um, so I think that we should use public money to get new things, uh, new things uh, in, obviously, and that must be uh, the main focus. Let me just add one thing to the, okay. to the fossil fuel uh, debate, because yes, there are subsidies for fossil fuels, but not within U OECD economies. This is uh, something you will find in the Arabic world a lot, and you will find it in parts of the developing world. I'm not going to defend it, but it's a fact that in many places you don't have the NAV office or the social security network that we have in Norway and in Europe. Yeah. And this is the way they distribute wealth, through access to energy uh, and uh, resources. Before the concluding remarks, of the, before the lunch break, let me have a little poll here. Do you believe in the 450 ppm scenario, Connie? Whether it's possible, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Are we beyond yeah, the point where it's possible? No, or I think is it it's still, still possible, but I think that time is, is uh, running out. The, the longer the world as such drags its, its feet, the more mm -hmm. challenging it's going to be and the more dramatic change we will be in for. Yes, but I think we need CCS. We need to... Carbon capture. Yes, we need to make that uh, work. Um, and we are working in uh, what I would call a motbacke, steep hill. Mm. Uh, it's been taking longer the time. The wind is blowing against you? Yeah. Yes, but uh, at the same time, it, uh, when the wind is blowing against you, you have the possibility to, to grow. So we are um, determined to continue. And I think we will succeed, but we need help not only from the European Union, but from the industry. And we need to make the global society believe that there will be a price to pay if you pollute. If okay, you this was and, and then, and brief then, answers. Yes. I think it's possible. 450 scenario. I, I think it is possible if we have strong politicians, but I need to have a European-wide perspective, including Norway, and look at the whole puzzle and not let every country build their own part mm -hmm. of the puzzle and hope they fit together in the end. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's now... All you all will get a few minutes for, uh, well, no, we don't have so many minutes left, but a few seconds then for concluding remarks. We started talking about Norway as the battery, as being a balancing power in the mix, uh, energy mix uh, of Europe. So let's start with you. I think, I, I think the technical potential is there, both for natural gas and for hydropower. Uh, I think the uncertainty for investors, both countries and companies that want to invest, is, is huge if you look at the 30-year perspective, and this, this equipment have a 30-year lifetime, and this uh, uncertainty needs to be reduced to, to get the right levels of investments now. So you need to have agreements uh, where you share the profits, you share the costs, and you share the risk. Well, what more? No, uh, I basically um, uh, agree. Um, and uh, that's uh, why I hope and believe that we will all engage in the very important debate that uh, Heather Guy and the Commission has uh, invited uh, to Europe after 2020, the road forward. I strongly hope and believe that uh, both Europe and Norway will have a leading role in forming well-functioning energy markets, not only in Europe, but also in the world. The yeah, last that word is goes exactly to you. That, that we must sort of understand that we should also think for the longer term and that is in Europe to get the targets right, to get the pricing right, to get the regulation right, and to be much better to apply the technologies that we already have and to get it up with scale and with speed. 
and then also get rid of our fossil fuel subsidies because unfortunately we also have pockets of that in different places in Europe still heavily subsidizing fossil fuels and uh, that should be part of getting our pricing right to get rid of that. Okay, thank you very much so much for coming here.